Bonjour, bonsoir. Je voudrais d'abord remercier <coughs> l'Académie des sciences et les organisateurs Pascal Cossard et Jules Hoffman euh, pour m'inviter à ce congrès. Et aujourd'hui, je vais parler du système drosophile du point de vue modèle et du point de vue modèle maladie humaine. So, I'm going to be talking about how flies uh, can contribute to the discovery of human diseases and their pathogenic mechanism. And this work is a teamwork at Baylor College of Medicine between my lab and the labs of uh, Shinya Yamamoto and Michael Wengler. So, as a model organism screening center, we are part of the undiagnosed disease network in the United States. And so the Undiagnosed Disease Network is a network of clinicians and basic scientists to, who work together to diagnose rare disease. And there are thousands, millions of patients in the United States and in Europe that have rare disease that have not been diagnosed for many years. And many of these are diseases that affect children that are born with diseases that have not been described in the literature And many of these uh, undergo what we call a diagnostic odyssey. They go from one doctor to another doctor to a hospital and eventually can now apply to the Undiagnosed Disease Network Coordinating Center. And they then are assigned a clinical site in any, oops. In any of these medical centers that are on this map. And they will undergo significant clinical testing. When they are accepted, they are DNA sequenced, and they sequence the DNA of the parents, and usually the kids, usually a trio. And if they discover new disease genes or, disease or genes that have not been described before, they will contact the model organism screening center and ask us to model these diseases in fruit flies, in zebrafish, or in mice. And so <clears throat> what we had to do first, and we learned quickly that we needed to do a very detailed bioinformatic study of each of the genes that were submitted because there is a huge amount of information available in the databases and we needed to mine those data before we would decide what we would do and which species we would focus on. And so we focus essentially on three species, C. elegans, Drosophila, and zebrafish. Now, we had the Model Organism Screening Center at Baylor, which is a zebrafish core, which is a uh, fly core. And in typical cases, what's happening is that the parents do not carry the mutation, but the kid carries a mutation. And we call this a de novo mutation. And that's about 65% of the cases are de novo mutations. We then look at the homologs of these genes in these three different species, and in 60% of the cases, we work on Drosophila. And, and <clears throat> that is because Drosophila has the most powerful tools and is the quickest to assess the function of these proteins in vivo. In about 25% of the cases, we work with zebrafish, and in about 5 to 10% of the cases, we either work with C. elegans or with mouse. And so, <clears throat> In these collaborative efforts, we not only interact as the, with the Undiagnosed Disease Network, but we also interact with these other consortium, like the Center for Mendelian Genomics and the Rare Disease Foundations in Canada, and currently uh, our lab, or my lab, interacts with many sites throughout Europe and in Asia. This project started about three years ago, and we already discovered or participated in the discovery of about 20 human disease genes that are listed here. And we use a variety of approaches in fruit flies uh, to do these studies, and I'm not going to belabor these, but I'm going to give you two examples, one related to this gene here, ACOX1, and one related to ANCL2. And we came to these genes in different ways. In the first case, it's the patient. It's what I just told you. It's a UDN case. It's the patient that contacted us through his physician. In the second case, it started with a fly screen where we identified a mutation and we uh, identified patients and bootstrapped our way uh, to the patient to gene matter. So <clears throat> a few words about ACOX1. ACOX1 is a peroxisomal enzyme. <clears throat> 
And I'll show that this peroxisomal enzyme plays a role in autoimmunity and that when you patients or flies lose this, they build up an autoimmune disease. But that the patient that was submitted to us was of a very different nature and that he uh, displayed very high levels of reactive oxygen species in his glia and this has led to the near complete loss of all the neurons in this patient. So <clears throat> the case was submitted and the boy was 12 years old when he had an ataxia He's now 18 years old and he's tetraplegic and cannot move anymore. He can barely speak at this point. So <clears throat> this was a progressive disease. And you can notice that there was no white matter demyelination, nor inflammatory response, nor increase of very long chain fatty acids. And that will become important because this was a very bizarre phenotype associated with this gene, ACOX1, because normally when kids have an ACOX1 deficiency, and there's about 30 cases in the literature, they are sick at birth, and they usually die within the first three or four years. They become blind and deaf and come completely paralyzed, tube-fed, and eventually die. So a very different progression than this patient. But this is a homozygous mutation. Uh, these kids lack both copies of ACOX1. And as you can see here, they have a white matter demyelination, they have an inflammatory response, and they have an increase in very long chain fatty acids, which was not observed here. Now, one of, these, one of the main problems we face when we work on human disease is we have an N of 1. And publishing an N of 1, as you know, as an experimental biologist, is always a problem. So we need to get other patients. And we typically do the, this through a program called Gene Matcher. And through Gene Matcher, we identified another patient in Korea, and this girl was diagnosed when she was eight, uh, <clears throat> is now 14 years, is uh, completely uh, paralyzed right now, and has similar lack of features that are associated with the deletion of this gene. So this suggests that these two mutations, which by the way are identical mutations in this protein, uh, are probably the cause of this disease. And so what is ACOX1? ACOX1 is a key enzyme in the peroxisomes. And <clears throat> in the peroxisomes, this ACOX1 will take very long chain fatty acids that are imported in the peroxisome and initiate the beta oxidation. And when the beta oxidation occurs, it produces a huge amount of hydrogen peroxide. And that hydrogen peroxide is really toxic, but there is a catalase that will remove the hydrogen peroxide, and so there is an equilibrium between these two. When we model disease in fruit flies, we start by knocking out the fly gene, and the way we do this is using the CRISPR technology by inserting this construct that you can see here that <coughs> has a poly A tail and therefore will arrest transcription at an early stage and truncate uh, the message in the production of the message. Not only will it do that, it will be fused to a GAL4 protein because there is a T2A GAL4 site. And so this GAL4 during translation will be separated from the uh, amino terminal portion of the message and the GAL4 can now be used to drive the GFP and determine where the gene is expressed because the GAL4 will bind to the US and drive the GFP and so by making this construct, we can determine where the gene is expressed. And we can also drive a human cDNA and rescue the fruit fly phenotype with the human cDNA. And this works in about 70% of the cases that we've tested so far. You can see that there is no protein made here and that there is literally a, a complete loss of this protein. These animals uh, don't do well. They make it to pupae and usually die as pupae and have a lot of black spots in these pupae. But a few animals survive. And usually they survive for about a few days, some to about 25 days. And so they're really short-lived. And when they're born, they, their you know, motility is pretty good. Their time to climb past a certain line is a second or two, so they're, they're, they're pretty active, but after a few days, they lose a lot of this activity and they become mostly uh, immobile. So we did electron microscopy on the neurons of 
uh, uh, these animals and on the nerves and noticed a major defect uh, when we looked at the wing uh, nerve. And if you look at this electron microscopy picture, that section through the nerve uh, in the wing of the fruit fly, you can see that these axons are insulated by glia that very nicely insulate each of these axons. But when you look in the mutant animals, there is a near complete loss of insulation and there is an 80% loss of uh, the axons and neurons. So there is a very severe phenotype and uh, that develops gradually and rapidly. Interestingly, these flies also develop these black spots. And these black spots are a marker that the immune system is defective. And what we argue here is that there is an incorporation of the very long chain fatty acids because obviously when you lose ACOX1, you're gonna have an elevation of these very long chain fatty acids. And those very long chain fatty acids are gonna be incorporated in the membranes of numerous cells, including glia, and they systematically increase over time and eventually uh, will kill the animal. And this melanization is the hallmark of a cellular immune system and and we, we'll hear more about this in flies probably from Chris Whitehouse and Marilyn Poiré later. Um, this immune system is very important for flies because there are 16 different parasitic wasps that lay eggs in Drosophila melanogaster alone. And they need to fight these wasp eggs because if they don't fight them, they will be eaten alive by the wasp. And so they use this immune system and they <coughs> typically uh, have their plasmatocytes, which we can compare to macrophages, uh, that will dif differentiate uh, into lamellocytes, and they will surround this foreign body and attack it. Now they do this to their own cells because they think that their cells are foreign, and so they build uh, an immune system against their uh, own cells. And this is essentially what's happening in patients. So if we look at the loss of function in patients, we see that the kids have a very severe denervation. They lose up to 80 and 90% of the axons in the peripheral nervous system. They build an immune system, which is actually quite similar to what happens in multiple sclerosis. And <clears throat> we've seen the same thing in flies. So we're confident that we developed a good model for testing this mutation that was found in the patient. And so we tested this mutation that was found in the patient and as you can see, when we express this protein, the wild-type human protein, uh, in <coughs> co-localize it with peroxisome, this protein is present in peroxisomes. When we express the mutant protein that was found in, this pa in these two patients, the, uh, we see that there is an accumulation of this protein in peroxisomes. And if you do a Westrom lot, you see that there is a massive amount of this dimer, and this is actually the active protein suggesting that this point mutation causes a dramatic gain of function. And indeed, when you look at the structure of this protein, it's normally a monomer, but when it binds to FAD, it forms a dimer, and that dimer is what will produce high levels of hydrogen peroxide. And, and this amino acid is in the center of the binding site with the FAD moiety in the middle of the protein. Clearly, uh, this looks like it's a strong gain of function mutation, and therefore they only need one copy of this mutation instead of loss of the two copies of the gene, just a mutation in one copy is sufficient to cause this phenotype. Now, when you express this uh, <clears throat> protein ubiquitously, flies, that's all they can do. They cannot fly, they cannot move, they cannot eat, and obviously they will die upon eclosion after about one day. So this is a very severe phenotype because these animals can clearly not live uh, at all. However, when we put these flies on high levels of an <coughs> antioxidant called N-acetylcysteine amide, which is a blood-brain barrier penetrating antioxidant, we can actually maintain the fly stock. Not only do the flies survive on this medium that has high levels of antioxidant, they can mate, they can fly, and they live at least for four to eight weeks on this medium. Clearly, this is a very strong suppression of the phenotype I just showed you, and this was interesting because the patient uh, 
were not treated with antioxidant, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We then looked at where the gene was expressed. I showed you that once you have inserted the GAL4, you can look at the protein expression pattern. And what is shown here is a third instar larval brain of the fruit fly, and you can see that the axons that exit the nervous system are clearly labeled. It turns, on, <laughs> it turns out that this gene is very abundantly expressed in wrapping glia. And in fact, expression of this mutant, I'll show you in a minute, in the wrapping glia alone is sufficient to kill the animal. So this gene, Paradoxically, even though it is a key gene in peroxisomes that are expressed in all cell, seems to play a major role in glia. And maybe this is not totally surprising because glia is nothing but fat. Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes, or wrapping glia, are very rich in fat and therefore have very high levels of very long chain fatty acids. And the peroxisomes are probably playing a role uh, an important role in these cells. And that is also what we found in the rats and mice. If you make a section through the sciatic nerve of a mouse and you look at the protein localization, you see that it's in the Schwann cells that surround the axons. This is a marker for axons. And <clears throat> it co-localizes very nicely with this nuclear marker for Schwann cells. As already mentioned, we expressed in the wrapping glia alone this dominant negative mutation and had a very short-lived fly that typically lives about 20 days. And by just expressing the catalase to remove the reactive oxygen species, you can restore the longevity. Also, these flies, this is the wrapping glia marker, clearly become impaired in their motility, and again, this can be suppressed by expressing the catalase or putting the flies on uh, AD4, this N-acetylcysteine amide, which is a blood-brain barrier crossing antioxidant. Now, <clears throat> we can now look at what's happening in culture in Schwann cells, which is, you know, wrap around the neurons of the periphery and the peripheral axons, and you can see that in Schwann cells, when you put in this and express with a retrovirus or with a lentivirus, this mutant isoform, you kill most of the Schwann cells. And you can again suppress this very nicely if in the medium you put an antioxidant. So I want to end this first story here with a, a few words about the patient. I told you that the patient is quadriplegic. Uh, when we look at the axons in this patient, there is a loss of about 80% of the Schwann cells. And so he has lost all peripheral senses and can obviously not move. And about six months ago or four months ago, we talked to the physicians and showed their data. And he was on immunosuppressants because they were assuming, like in the loss of function, that they needed to treat the patient with immunosuppressants. They stopped treating with immunosuppressants and went to feeding very high levels of anestylcysteine amide. Uh, <clears throat> and the patient has improved quite a bit, is back in his wheelchair, and sent me an email that he can speak again. And for him, that was a major achievement. So what we're trying to do here is use the fruit fly uh, to not only work on the mechanisms of disease, but also to develop drugs and go back to the clinic and try uh, to intervene. And here you see what's happening at the bottom when you have a <clears throat> loss of ACOX1 and you have this alter very long chain fatty ma acid metabolism that lead to an immune cell activation and there you need to treat with immunosuppressants. But in this case, you have elevated ROS in the glial cells and their uh, anacetylcysteine uh, is a positive, uh, has a positive effect on the treatment. And so before I move to the second story, I would like to give credit to the physician who brought this uh, gene to our attention, <clears throat> Tiffany Vogel, and the postdoc in my lab, uh, Locke Lee, who did most of the work. And I want to switch to another case that relates to human disease. And relates to ankle 2 microcephaly and the Zika virus. What is shown here is a third instar larval brain uh, of a fly that's stained, or a larvae, I should say, that's stained 
with ankle 2 and Balkan. And you can see that in the nuclei, you see this marker here, Balkan, and in green, which labels more, most of the neuroblasts and the neurons, you see this other marker, ankle 2. This story was started by screening for a <clears throat> set of genes that would cause neurodegenerative phenotype or neurodevelopmental phenotype. And I'm not going to belabor this screen, but what we did is we first induced mutations in flies that caused the flies to die, so we want mutations in essential genes. We then make clones in the eye and record electroretinograms. Spoken electrode here, an electrode in the thorax shine light and record, and record electroretinograms. <clears throat> and what we're screening for is electroretinograms that either by day one are defective, and that is a neurodevelopmental mutant, or that progressively becomes defective, and that is a neurodegenerative mutant. We've identified doing this 700 mutations and identified 165 genes. All these genes were then uh, analyzed using, confo <coughs> using confocal microscopy and electron microscopy. And this <coughs> was very useful and helped us to characterize a lot of new genes. One of these genes was ANCO2. And so the screen here was actually not the ERG screen. It's the same mutations were also screened in the thorax for the loss of bristles. And as you know, the bristles of the insects are peripheral nervous system organs. And in the clones, they lost these bristles. And when you look at the clones with confocal microscopy, what you see is that there is a loss of glia and neurons in these clones. We posted all of the 165 genes on GeneMatcher to find if physicians had identified mutations in those genes. And we got a hit for ankle 2 where there was a father who carried a mutation, a, mo a mother who carried a truncation in this gene ankle 2. And they had two kids, and both of these kids had very severe microcephaly. This is about the most severe microcephaly you can get. These kids have about 30% of the normal brain volume and they typically don't grow and don't progress, don't develop, don't develop speech, uh, and uh, are mostly blind. And so <clears throat> these parents had two of these kids, and uh, we were obviously eager to find out if the gene that we had identified was the cause of this severe microcephaly. And <clears throat> The way we did this is we looked at the third instar larval nervous system, and you can see that indeed in the third instar larval system, although the third instar larvae are normal in size, their brain is quite reduced in size. And we could rescue that by ubiquitously overexpressing the human ankle too. In fact, these animals are lethal and die uh, as pupae. These animals are viable when you express the, the human ankle too and have a normal brain volume and normal behavior. So we were eager to figure out really what the phenotypes were that were associated with the loss of this gene and what caused the small brain phenotype. And <clears throat> what we saw is that there was a significant loss of neuroblasts, which are obviously the precursors of the neurons. There was a massive amount of cell death in the brains of these animals. So there is a decrease in neuroblasts. There is a decrease uh, or increase in cell death. And uh, the cells, the neuroblasts, when they divide, produce much smaller clones, and these cells are sick, as I said, and eventually will die. So you have a combination of uh, a series of phenotypes here. Now, the next question is, what, what is the function of ankle 2 and what is the function of this protein uh, in vivo? And Nikki, the postdoc who worked on that, started looking at the asymmetric determinants. And so a few words about the asymmetric determinants. When a neuroblast divides, it has to replace itself. It's a stem cell. And so it has to recreate a neuroblast. And these cells will then become ganglion motor cells or neurons later. But it needs to replenish itself. And it does it by asymmetric segregation of these two complexes, one is bazooka APKC and uh, PAR6, the other is the Brat Miranda Stauffen Prospero complex. So when the cell divides, this portion will make sure, and these determinants will make sure that you reform a neuroblast, and this makes sure that this cell will go on and uh, form neurons. So when you look at this pathway, since we lose neuroblasts and we have problems in the divisions, 
and most of the cells died, which suggested they take uh, the wrong fate, is that ankle 2 somehow uh, controls this because when you look at the asymmetric determinants in ankle 2, you can clearly see that the apical and the basal complex is completely mislocalized in a substantial fraction, not in all, but in a substantial fraction of the neuroblast, and the phenotype gets progressively worse. So now we need to figure out what's known about ankle 2. There was only one paper about ankle 2 when we started working on this gene, and that was a paper in C. elegans <coughs> that is shown here, where they argued that ankle 2, when you lose it, you have a gain of function of this Balkan VRK1 kinase. And so the idea is that ankle 2 suppresses this kinase, and in C. elegans, it was shown to play a role in nuclear envelope reformation. So we wanted to find out when we lose ankle 2, and we identified a mutation in the screen that was a partial loss of function mutation, if we remove a single copy of VRK1, can we restore some of the phenotypes since when ankle, ankle 2 is a suppressor, if we have a partial loss of function of ankle 2, there should be too much function for a VRK1 or Balkan. And the suppression was beyond our belief because these animals that are homozygous for ankle 2 die as pupae, but a single copy removal of this VRK1 kinase not only suppressed the lethality, but restored the brain size completely. And these animals are viable. So loss of just one copy of this downstream factor of ankle 2 really potently suppresses the microcephaly. So what's the function of ankle 2 with respect to this kinase, this VRK1? Miki did a very careful analysis of the expression pattern of the proteins and showed that VRK1 is always in the nucleus of the cells, as is shown here, except during this stage here, <clears throat> during the metaphase, where the protein, the VRK1, because of the breakdown of the nuclear envelope, diffuses throughout the cytoplasm and then is put back into the nucleus at the end of mitosis. But if you look in the ankle 2 mutations, you see that the protein is constitutively and diffusely present throughout the cytoplasm. So the function of ankle 2 is to make sure that the VRK1 stays in the nucleus and, is, and remains in the nucleus. And that's clearly not true when you remove uh, ankle 2, as is shown here. We then turn to fibroblast of patients, and we've been collected fibroblast of patients to see where would these proteins be in the fibroblast of patients, and we saw exactly the same phenotype. If you look at the heterozygous parent fi fibroblast, the VRK1 and the DNA perfectly co-localized, but when you look at the patient, the fibroblast from the patient kit, much of the VRK1 is in the cytoplasm, and <clears throat> you can clearly see the change in fluorescence in the nucleus because the mostly DNA, most of the protein is now in the cytoplasm. So the same phenotype that we observe in flies is also observed in the fibroblast of these patients. So now <clears throat> we've shown you that ankle 2 suppresses Balkan the VRK1 and that directly impinges on this pathway in the apical localization of these proteins. And there is this protein called LGL, lethal giant larvae, which interacts with this kinase, this EPA APKC kinase and plays an important role. Uh, LGL will lead to <coughs> uh, phosphorylation of APKC1, and APKC1 will lead to the phosphorylation of LGL, and there is a tug of war there. So we looked at the proteins, and as you can see in ankle 2 mutants, there is a dramatic loss of the phosphorylation of APKC. And when you look at ankle 2 here and you look at the phosphorylation of LGL, there is a decrease of the phosphorylation of LGL. And if you remove a single copy of Balkan, you pretty dramatically restore this phenomena. And that is very consistent with what's been published about the role of these proteins, namely that when LGL is associated with the membranes, it blocks the function of APKC. When it's phosphorylated, it and disengages from the membrane and uh, allow the protein complexes to be properly localized. So this then predicts that 
there is a key player here, we can remove now one of these key players, which is regulated by VRK1, and again, restore viability and brain size, although it's not as nice as for VRK1. It's, again, a very potent suppression, suggesting that, indeed, VRK1 directly controls the interaction here. In fact, VRK1 binds to APKC and LGL, and it's the interaction between these two proteins that will regulate the apical localization of this complex. And if you disrupt this, you disrupt this apical localization. So now, in the last two or three slides, I want to come back to this microcephaly. I told you that loss of ankle 2 in flies causes microcephaly, causes microcephaly in human. And about a year and a half ago, I had a call from Nevin Krogan from UCSF, and his postdoc Priya Shao told me, Dr. Bellin, are you still working on ankle 2? And I say, sure, we're working on ankle 2. We've worked out most of the pathway. He said, we did a very large proteomic screen and found that there was only one protein of the Zika virus that would bind to the protein that you're studying, ankle 2, and that protein is NS4A. And so <clears throat> we may hear more about dengue and Zika virus, but this is a single messenger RNA encodes 10 proteins. There's 10 proteins are all present in the ER, and NS4A is one protein there. And NS4A, like ankle 2 both proteins are obviously in the ER, and there we've shown there is a direct physical interaction by many different criteria between these proteins. And so <clears throat> that is clearly playing a role in that process. And so we then simply expressed the NS4A Zika virus protein in the fly, and that is the most severe microcephaly we've ever seen. So just overexpression of the Zika virus protein in the fly brain causes a very severe microcephaly. And we can now test if this is the same pathway that we've just described before. Does it work through VRK1? Does it work through LGO? And the answer is if you remove in that mutant, that overexpresses uh, NS4A, one copy of Balkan, you very nicely restore the brain size and viability. And the same is true for LGL. You again very nicely restore that pathway. So I want to end up with this last slide because these are all new microcephaly genes in human. We know that NS4A causes microcephaly. We've shown that ANCO2 causes microcephaly. Balkan VRK1 was shown by a colleague of mine at Baylor College of Medicine, Jim Lupski, to cause microcephaly. And these proteins regulate this pathway here, which uh, LGL is a critical component of the Smith-McGuinness deletion syndrome. And we've now shown that there are patients with mutations in LGL that have microcephaly. And that regulates this complex here. And so all of these are novel uh, genes that are now tied together in a new uh, human microcephaly pathway. And I'm going to end in my last slide and uh, give acknowledgement to the people, the, <clears throat> already uh, acknowledge the people for the ACOX-1, but uh, the ankle 2 story was a collaboration with Jim Lupski and Nikki Link in my lab uh, did most of the work. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing talk, and uh, we have uh, time for questions. So if there are questions, you have a little button on, on your right or on the left, but you have to put your finger up so I can identify those who want to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Hugo. Um, so, so it wasn't clear to me what was exactly going on with the ankle too. I mean, great talk, first of all, but that's usual. Um, the ankle 2 mutants, uh, who's dying? The neuroblasts, the neurons, um, and, and what is happening to the division pattern of the neuroblasts when, when you don't have the proper localization of the apical and basal? So the, the phenotype in the neuroblast is that there are fewer neuroblasts that are specified. Then when the neuroblasts are specified and start running out of maternal component, uh, they start having a division problem and they produce many fewer neurons or they divide asymmetrically in, but in a weird way and during that asymmetric division uh, they typically turn on 
the genes that will cause them to disappear and so they induce uh, autophagy or uh, cell death and uh, they disappear. So it, it, it's a mixed phenotype, it's not a very clear-cut phenotype and it, in fact it's very similar to the APKC loss. There's a very tight interaction with APKC and the loss of APKC causes very similar phenotypes. But it's a complex phenotype, it's not a very clean-cut phenotype. Uh, I have one little question. So finally, at the end of the day, uncle protein is doing what? Well, uh, the, the key of this protein is to make sure that in neuroblast you have a proper segregation yeah. Yeah, yeah. of these two groups. And it does it through the control of VRK1. And that is a kinase, and that kinase controls the phosphorylation yeah. of the apical complex and APKC and LGL. And so you so think this uncle is just interacting with the RK1? Just preventing it? Yes, okay. we think that it's just preventing the okay. exit of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And once you have that, VRK1 becomes toxic because it phosphorylates substrate that it shouldn't phosphorylate.